So we're going to talk about 3D printing, of course, what you're all here for. And in the last five years, 3D printing has made huge strides. So now designers and engineers have access to carbon fiber parts that are stronger than aluminum and more fatigue resistant. And shortly, those same people have access to high strength metal printing. So we're going to frame this and look at this with a quick video of how high strength printing is changing the world from education to medical to Formula One driving. You're going to get a glimpse at the factory of the future. Can we have the audio? The mechanical engineer's eternal problem is waiting for parts. And with 3D printing, that whole cycle of design and wait goes from design and wait uh, six weeks to design and wait a day, which is basically everyone's dream. BattleBots to me is somewhere between a hobby and a career, right? It's not only what I cut my teeth in engineering on, but it's what I helped many, many new builders come into the sport doing. With the Markforge printers, it's the reliability that honestly gets you every time. If you can't trust your printer to leave it alone overnight, then you're not getting anything done any faster than you would with a conventional method. It's a super low effort, and I like low effort. Engineers, you know, we're finding more and more lazy ways to change the world. Somebody once asked me why we put so much effort into how the printer looked and how it was built. And my answer was, if we don't care about how our product looks, why would you believe that we're going to care about how your part looks? This is industrial. I mean, this is a different scale. It's insane, to be honest with you, when you can think you can actually print a metal piece. I'll take the carbon pieces. I'm a carbon guy and a raising guy, carbon fiber the whole way. But it's incredible. This is not looks like, feels like. This is like, works like, keeps working like, and you forgot that you 3D printed it because it's still working. Most of the work that I do is in the orthopedics and trauma realm and trying to make a difference in uh, you know, people's lives. What I'm holding in my hands here is, is a external fixator part. Each kit that basically you use for a patient costs about two, three thousand dollars. And this one is a 3D printed version of that. It costs five dollars that does the same thing and you can throw it away and don't feel guilty about it. Our customers who are using our printers, they have parts on their desk that they're showing how much time and cost they've saved. The Mark IV's products affords us the ability to take greater risks. Having the ability to print something that's not as expensive kind of rekindles your imagination. Originally, 3D printing at Dixon Bow was for research and development. And over time, as the technology advanced, we took it from rapid prototyping into functional prototypes. We can go in entirely different directions because we will be able to produce things that you can't produce other ways. At the end of the day, every engineer just wants to make a perfect design. 3D printing lets you get a little closer, or a lot closer. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk about, when we say printing high strength parts, we're going to talk about the entire range of parts. So this is plastic, so nylons reinforced with microcarbon fiber. This is continuous composites. So you have parts that are now 19 to 23 times stronger than baseline plastic. And this is metal. So this is tool steels, stainless steels, aluminums, titaniums, inconels, et cetera. Right? And so you can have this full range of parts across an entire lineup of printers, from an entry-level desktop printer, which is many people's first printer, to a carbon fiber desktop printer, uh, all the way up to an industrial composite printer, and now a metal printer. And with this, you know, it's not just enough to make hardware and materials. It's all about actually the software, right? So with this, you have a easy to use piece of software, cloud connected that in the composite side, lets you look at how the composites are designed, change the design if you want, modify the design. 80% of users use the default settings. The software is intelligent. It helps you automatically make strong parts. The top 20%, the Boeing, the Airbus, the et cetera of the world, they can go in layer by layer, physically edit exactly where the carbon fiber is going to go to get the maximum high strength part. And all this is wrapped in a layer of enterprise-grade security. So as we'll see later, uh, the military uses this, government agencies use this, aerospace companies. And we've gone through many, many uh, what you'd call stress tests of this and pass everyone. And what's, what's really revolutionary about this process and these, and these parts is a surface finish. So we'll have uh, go by the booth, check out the parts. The surface finish of the parts you see 
is exactly how they came off the printer, which means you spend less time post-process, you have higher accuracy and higher resolution. So much so that this little piece here, this little ball joint, is printed, taken off the printer, actually printed on two separate printers. The top cap screws directly onto the base with no post-process. This is the kind of speed and accuracy that allows a mechanical engineer to design a part, print the part, and put it in service that same day. So we have thousands of printers around the world. We'll look at that in a minute. We do, uh, because everything's cloud connected, we can look at averages. So the averages of the time, seven hours to print a part, compared to about 340 for CNC machining, which is always a benchmark for us. And the average cost, $42 per part, compared to 900. So as our friend John said, huge time, huge cost savings. So this little uh, company history, founded in 2013, we released the world's first carbon fiber printer in 2014. All the dots are companies that are using the printers. About a year later, we came out with the Mark II. It's uh, same form factor, higher resolution, higher strength, easier to use. Then we got on what we'll talk about later, a six month hardware cycle. So every six months after the two came out, there was a new version and a better version. So then the uh, Mark X came out, the Onyx series, the Mark X being the industrial, Metal X ships in January, and here we are, so now the industrial series. So all these dots, which look kind of like a blur, are companies around the world using high strength 3D printing, oftentimes for the first time. And then currently where we are, uh, 102 employees growing at 300% uh, year over year, and uh, the, the Metal X, sorry, the Mark X, they're very similar, uh, has a net promoter score of 85. And if you're familiar with net promoter scores, uh, Comcast is negative. It goes from like negative 100 to 100. Comcast is slightly deeply negative. Apple is estimated to be in the 60s. Sonos is estimated to be in the 70s or 80s. We have on the uh, Mark X a net promoter score of 85, which we're extremely happy about. And that really underscores how easy it is to use and how easy it is to get high strength parts the first time. So this is uh, actually a three-year-old customer list, we've ran out of space, but uh, basically, as John said, 3D printing is used in every industry, right? Everybody who designs parts, who makes parts, needs access to those parts. So here's an example of an automotive customer. Every 12 seconds, a car comes off the assembly line. The, the biggest problem of line down failure for this customer was when the car comes crashing down onto the frame that drives it forward, there were four aluminum pins. And those pins would cyclically fatigue and break. And when the pin breaks, you hit the line down button. That means your finance department is bleeding money and you're not making any cars. It's the worst thing in manufacturing. So with the Mark I, when the Mark I came out, for $5,500, an engineer on that assembly line bought the printer, printed the exact same part in continuous fiberglass. When he put it on the line, he told nobody because he was afraid he'd get fired. He ran that line for four months, the pin didn't break. Other pins around it were breaking, so he replaced the other pins on the cell. Ran that for another six months, and finally told his boss. And then they replaced the entire line with, with uh, fiberglass printed pins, and the number one cause of line down failure is gone. Okay, this is the very, very famous, if you haven't seen it before, 3D printed GE jet engine nozzle. The interesting thing about this photo is that the jet engine nozzle is being post-processed on a fixture printed on one of our desktop printers. Why do you do this? One of the things about aviation is you don't want to get scratches on your hardware because, again, cyclic fatigue, scratches lead to cracks, lead to failures. So you print a fixture that has continuous carbon fiber, so it's as strong as metal, but the outside is nylon, so it's scratch resistant, so it won't impart a scratch on your fixture. So all the post-processing, the inspection, the laser marking to get this revolutionary nozzle into flight is done on fixtures printed on desktop printers that cost less than $10,000. Okay, here's, uh, you're not supposed to pick favorites, but I do. Uh, here's an end effector for a uh, company in uh, Maryland, my hometown. Dixon Valve, they, uh, they were facing incredible price pressure from imported uh, couplings. Okay, so they hired two engineers, the two that you saw in that video, uh, who were amazing. And they went through and they took all these pieces that they used to CNC machine, 
And they bought 3D printed end effectors from a service bureau. They bought every material they could get. They run them through chemical tests. They ran them through life cycle tests. And then they called us up one day and said, yours were the parts that worked. So they are able to now retool this factory in a day. Now, when we talk about the entire range of parts, when you're making a coupling, you, when you want to, the, you know, for example, a fire hose coupling, you don't want to scratch the interface of the fire hose. On the back end of it, there's a thread. For high impact loading, you want metals. So they used to print, they used to print uh, all the pieces out of composites, the one on the right to hold it in the CNC machine, the one over here to hold it in the inspection fixture. But the middle piece, when they printed in composites, only lasted 15,000 cycles because the point loading was too high. Now they print it in metal and they have the ideal solution for not scratching it in the CNC machine, not scratching it in the inspection fixture, and surviving the threats. They now have over half a million cycles on those metal end effectors. OK, so most of you, uh, we were here last year. Most of the people seem to remember us. Uh, you're familiar with the uh, composite printers. Take a look at the way it looks. The metal printer is basically like the composite printer upside down, right? Uh, it's kind of funny that way. So in the composite printer, we do material handling on the bottom. On the metal printer, same thing, but the material handling on the top. So we'll talk about metal. OK. It's a very exciting time in 3D printing. It's exciting because for the first time, you can get parts that are equivalent to a cast part, like a one-to-one -one equivalency, isotropic strength, high temperature, hardness, for super low cost. So we'll talk about the process. You design that end effector. You design it in your favorite CAD program. Half the CAD community is here, so I'm not going to pick favorites. We'll get in trouble for that. Once you design it, you bring it into, uh, you will print this thing. So here's a little time lapse. You're doing the first base of it, a couple hundred more layers, a couple hundred more layers, a couple hundred more layers. You put it in a washing station. The washing station, these, if, you, if you're familiar with our composite printers, they print a nylon with a microcarbon dust. When you think about the metal, think about printing that same nylon, but now it's half wax. And instead of a microcarbon dust, you have a metal dust. Before you center this, you have to wash out that half of the wax. And what that does is it turns your part into a sponge structure that allows the rest of the plastic to vaporize in the sintering process. Then you put it in a furnace. You center it. It gets hot. Uh, here's the cool part. With this new process, you can create lightweight honeycomb structures. So this is a brake lever for off my Ducati. The top one has the, has the top on it. It's the one I actually use. The bottom one is stopped part way, so you can see there's a honeycomb that runs through the entire lever. This is a stainless steel lever that's 60% air. It can be made no other way. Why does this matter? This matters because you can take this lever, you can print it, it's lighter, it has the hardness of stainless steel, but it has the weight of aluminum. Now, when you take that and you put it into an end effector, going back to Dixon valve, this end effector has the surface hardness, the temperature resistance, the fatigue resistance of stainless steel, but it's 60% lighter. What that means is that, and this is all slowed down so that the uh, surface plates can be off so you can put the camera in there. What it means is that what limits how fast this arm can move is the weight of that end effector. If you can make the end effector lighter, you can get higher throughput and you can make basically your factory more productive and more efficient, which is why we always talk about getting a glimpse into the factory of the future. And these are all the couplings. The beautiful part of this story is after Dixon Valve went and retooled with 3D printing, they were able to come out with a lower cost product at a higher margin. Now they're the low cost solution and they're making great margins. This is all about efficiency. So when we talk about metal, we talk about an end-to-end -end solution for the, an entry level price of 125,000. That's the printer, the washing station, and the sintering furnace. Here's the thing. When you make prototypes, you need to scale them up, right? So if you're making end effectors, you'll make one to two. But those little ball joints that you've seen, or that if you come by the booth, you'll see, we make thousands a month. When you want to scale up, you no longer use a small furnace. We leverage large furnaces that are currently in existence at metal injection molding companies. So we've sold to a lot of metal injection molding companies about uh, the on the slide with the logos. Many of the customers that you see on that slide have these furnaces or have access to them. So the way you scale up is parallelization. You have this process that inherently scales up. You hit it with hundreds of printers running in parallel, the same way the internet's built. 
and you control it with Cloud Connected software. And the net result, if you come by the shop and you check out our print farm, uh, 11,000 sample parts per month. 